Hello, and welcome to today's webcast, Building ETF Portfolios to Generate Alpha, sponsored by Chaikin Analytics. Today's live web ha webcast has been accepted for one CFP, one SEMA, and one CFA CE credit. For questions on credit, please use the number on your console. A copy of today's presentation, as well as additional documents, can be found in the green folder at the bottom of your screen. We also have a brief survey, which can be accessed from the teal folder. Our speaker will be taking advisor questions. Please type your questions in the box to the right of the slides. We'll get to as many of your questions as possible. If you are interested in a one-on-one -on -one meeting with Chaikin Analytics, please click the blue one-on-one -on -one folder at the bottom of your screen and confirm the request. A replay of this webcast will be made available. All registrants will receive replay information by email 24 hours after the webcast ends. Today's speaker is Mark Chaikin. He has been on Wall Street for 50 years, building quantitative investment models for institutional investors, and has been speaking to the RIA database community for Chaikin Analytics and partners like Index IQ and NASDAQ. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Mark Chaikin, CEO for Chaikin Analytics. Mark? Thank you, Natalie, and welcome, everybody. We're going to cover some really interesting ground today. Uh, and we've already had a question, is this uh, pointed toward advisors who create active uh, portfolios? And in a sense, it is. Uh, it's not just with ETFs, but with the best stocks and the best ETFs. Obviously, if you're following your firm's allocation sleeve, uh, you're sort of committed to the vehicles that they've picked. Uh, but uh, this will be, I think, uh, very, very instructional, even for people who are uh, following firm allocations. So a little bit of my background. Uh, as Natalie said, I've been on Wall Street for over 50 years. I'm noticing on CNBC that another 50-year veteran, Leon Cooperman, is hanging up his hat, uh, which is um, a sort of a, a seminal day for the hedge fund community. Uh, I did retire 10 uh, years um, from 2000. Uh, 1998 to 2008, and actually came out of retirement after the financial collapse of 08 to form Chaikin Analytics. Uh, for 45 years, I've been using technical analysis, but always in conjunction with fundamentals. Fundamentals drive the market. That's one of the key slides and premises uh, in today's webinar deck and also drives everything we do at Chaikin Analytics. Um, the reason I've used technical analysis is that when I headed the options department at Tucker Anthony, uh, without technical analysis, options traders and even people trying to generate income are a little bit lost. And I've survived 10 bear markets and technical analysis is the reason that I've been able to do that uh, because I think, as all of you know, fundamental analysis uh, is great in a bull market, but in a bear market, uh, if all you're doing is relying on fundamentals, you're just a chip on the wave. Along the way, I've been mentored by some of the smartest and most successful institutional investors. Some of them were colleagues, some of them were clients. And the reason that's important is when I came out of retirement in 2009 to start Shaken Analytics, my goal was to draw on everything I had learned selling technical analysis workstation to fundamentally oriented buy side investors and distill that down into a uh, rating system, an objective multi-factor model, although nobody was talking about multi-factor ba back in 2009. And it, we call it the Chaikin Power Gauge Rating, and it's really the culmination of my life's work. And you'll see the factors in the model, how we apply it to individual stock selection, how we use it to uh, zero in on sector and industry group ETFs, and I think you're going to find this very interesting. We'd like to start uh, today's webinar with a poll question. So, Natalie, you're on. Great. Thank you so much, Mark. The first poll question reads, are you fully committed to the market? You can choose from the following. Yes, I am all in. Holding some money on the sidelines or playing defense right now? And you can click your answer right on the screen and hit submit. Again, your answer choices are, yes, I am all in, holding some money on the sidelines, or playing defense right now. 
All right, Mark, it looks like about 55% say that they're holding some money on the sidelines with about 40% saying, yes, they are all in. What are your thoughts on these results? Well, I think it's interesting that uh, very few play, uh, people are playing defense right now, and that's, I think, appropriate. Uh, we talk to advisors every day. I was just out in California um, meeting with advisors on Thursday and Friday, and we do hear uh, concerns and get questions about uh, tariff policy, where currencies are going, uh, interest rates, and so forth. But in general, I think people are impressed with the strong trend in the market, uh, with the strong earnings that uh, are coming out here in the second quarter, building on the first quarter. Uh, and most advisors are, are concerned about asset allocation and being in the right sectors, avoiding weak sectors if they're doing, um, you know, sort of uh, ETF uh, construction themselves. So. I thought we'd start the webinar by looking at what we've been dealing with here for the last uh, six months in 2018. Uh, we've gone from an uptrend on autopilot in 2017 to a roller coaster of a correction. Uh, 2017 was easy if you didn't get influenced by the headlines. And believe me, if you watch CNBC at all or read the um, uh, the financial press, you know that there were a lot of reasons that people offered up to turn bearish on the market. None of them have panned out. And even the noise of the tariff wars and potential currency wars have failed to disrail or derail this, um, this bull market. It's an earnings-driven bull market. But just to put corrections into perspective, we've drawn this chart uh, that looks at declines in the S&P 500 since 1945. So anything uh, between 5 and 10 percent is called a pullback. Uh, we didn't even get a 3 percent pullback in 2017. If you were following the trend of the market and you were fully invested, it was a great year for stocks. Uh, once, uh, and there have been 75 pullbacks of 5 and 10 percent. So they're normal, and the interesting thing is they only last about a month, and within a month you move back up to new highs. The more challenging uh, type of pullback is called a correction. That's between 10 and 20 percent drop in the S&P 500. We've had now 28 of them, because this doesn't include the most recent one that we had in uh, February and March of 2018. And this is the interesting take away from me from this slide. The average length is four months, and within three months, the market moves back to new all-time highs. So 13% average decline. This decline was 13.4% to the intraday low of 25.33 uh, back in um, February. We tested that low, as we'll see on the next slide, and then we moved back up. Now, the S&P 500 has been lagging, but the NASDAQ 100 and the Russell 2000 small cap index have already moved back up to new highs. Bottom line, everything we've experienced since the peak on January 26th is normal. So don't get spooked by the headlines. That's so critical. I was uh, asked at this conference that I spoke at, uh, in Napa on Friday uh, to give one recommendation at the end of my talk. And most of the other people representing major fund groups like um, BlackRock and Invesco pitched uh, one of their favorite investment vehicles, their own, obviously. My recommendation to the advisors, and there are about 50 of them there, stick to your plan and don't be distracted by the headlines. If you do that, Selection is the easiest part. It's when you get off message and let the headlines influence you. So what should advisors be focusing on this year? Well, the trend of corporate earnings to me is absolutely critical. We're in the middle of uh, second quarter earnings season here. It's expected to show 20% year-over-year growth, uh, with more growth yet to come in Q3 uh, and Q4. Obviously, part of that is because of the tax. Uh, cut that was enacted in December, but it's an earnings-driven bull market. Now, in Q1, in April, we had a sell-on-the-news mentality. We've seen less of that in Q2. 
Um, you'll see an example of one of our favorite stocks and team based on our power gauge model. They reported fabulous earnings this morning. Uh, there was a little bit of profit taking. Why? Because the stock was making new highs uh, into the earnings report. Advisors should also be interested in watching interest rates, and we'll give you a slide on that in a minute. In a period of rising interest rates, sector and industry group selection is very important, and uh, individual stock selection is also important in a period of rising interest rates, less so in periods where interest rates are falling. So let's look at a one-year chart of the SPY as a proxy for the market. This is the large cap um, ETF that mirrors the S&P 500. And what we see here in this one-year chart is that we made what's known as a W-shaped bottom in uh, February and March. This is how corrections of between 10 and 20 percent almost always end. They don't end in a V-shaped bottom. That's what pullbacks look like, 5 to 10 percent. So again, very normal. And then uh, we've been in a well-established uh, intermediate-term uptrend since March. But we're just now breaking out above 2,800 in the S&P 500 index. We got as high as 2,830 today. Our longstanding target for uh, Chaikin Analytics for 2018, 2,850 to 3,000 on the S&P 500. Uh, the NASDAQ and the Russell have already achieved our target. So uh, from my point of view, it's an earnings-driven bull market. Large caps have been lagging. Uh, we said two weeks ago we thought they are going to play catch up. That's what's been happening. Small caps obviously benefit uh, from rising interest rates, from uh, any sort of tariff wars because they're less impacted by them than large cap companies. But we think that large caps and financials in particular, which benefit from rising interest rates, are going to start uh, taking the leadership away. And here's a, a one-year chart of the TLT ETF, the 20-year treasury. And we see that interest rates have basically been in a trading range. This is obviously the inverse, uh, which represents the yield. And so as bonds are moving down now, yields are moving up toward the 3% level. Possible we'll get above 3%. Another reason not to be spooked by the headlines. Everybody's been talking about a flattening yield curve as bearish for the market. The reality is it's not. When you invert, it's still not bearish for another nine months at a minimum. So it's a very favorable climate that we're in right now. And that imbues everything that we talk about in our weekly market letters and in our daily market letters at Chaikin Analytics. The likely scenario for 2018, higher interest rates and rising earnings. It's a bullish scenario. This chart's courtesy of Bank America, Merrill Lynch. And so when you hear that rising interest rates are bearish for the market, it's not true. If rising interest rates are a function of an improving economy that's not yet overheated, and that's the case right now, then they're bullish for the market because they tell you the strong loan demand and earnings and the economy are strong. So we're in a very strong environment. And I want to focus now on what happens in a period of rising interest rates because there's clear-cut differentiation between the sectors that do well in a period of rising interest rates and the ones that do poorly. The ones that do poorly are typically the defensive interest rate sensitive sectors like utilities, consumer staples, healthcare, now real estate. The ones that do best are the cyclical stocks, financials, industrials, technology, energy, and materials. The outlier is consumer discretionary. Part of the reason is it's a very, very a diverse group. You've got domination by Amazon, although they're going to be changing the uh, sector constituents in September. Uh, you've got home builders. You've got uh, auto stocks, restaurants, retailers. It's, it's a diverse group. But clearly, the uh, six sectors or the five sectors at the bottom left do well in a period of rising interest rates. So let's see what's happened over the last month. Well, after a period where the market wasn't quite certain uh, whether to be defensive or not, uh, we're starting to see this pattern take hold. Technology and financials have outperformed. Industrials starting to perform better. Uh, energy, healthcare is still up there, 
But at the bottom, we're starting to see the defensive sectors underperforming just in the last month, consumer staples, utilities, and real estate. So the patterns do tend to repeat. This is based on uh, 50 years of data. So uh, they're reliable, and we're going to show you how to take advantage of that. Now, as we talk to advisors and try and show them how to use Chaikin Analytics in their practice, uh, we are confronted with uh, one common thread. There's just too much information to process. Uh, information overload is the bane of our existence in our personal lives and in our careers in the financial industry. So at Chaikin, we've created Chaikin Analytics for iPad and desktop as the solution, the antidote, if you will, to information overload. It can save you time and increase your productivity. And I'd like to uh, sort of give you a little bit of proof, social proof, if you will, Malden Economics. Many of you know John Malden, Jim Cramer. It features uh, Chaikin Money Flow as well as the Chaikin Power Gauge, our fundamental indicator on Mad Money. And we're being used by some of our old institutional clients uh, like Fidelity Investments and Soros Fund Management and Paulson. So a lot of the pros are using Chaikin Analytics. Uh, our primary constituent is high net worth individuals and advisors like yourself. Now, everything that we do at Chaikin Analytics is infused with the notion that fundamentals drive the market, even though I'm known for technical analysis. But emotions drive the market to extremes. We saw that in February, uh, first in January when the market peaked in sort of a French curve type up move, and then that waterfall decline in February and March. So for me, in 50 years of Wall Street, the path to profits has always been to combine fundamentals with technicals. Now the problem is, how do you do the fundamental research? Well, obviously, if you're at a big investment bank, you've got a research department. Uh, if you're an independent advisor, you're going to find various uh, resources to um, rely on for fundamental research. No matter where you're situated, you need a discipline methodology. Whether you're using ETFs or mutual funds or whether you're building bottom-up stock portfolios. So this discipline sort of encapsulates the, um, this pyramid rather, encapsulates the discipline methodology that we've been preaching and teaching at Chaikin Analytics for the last uh, seven years. At the top of the pyramid are fundamental multi-factor model distilled down to a gauge. We call it the Chaikin Power Gauge. And sector rankings and industry group rankings, very important. And we look at them very differently, and we're about to enhance that view uh, in August. At the bottom of the pyramid, we like to confirm the fundamentals with technicals. So Chaikin Money Flow, which many of you know on all the uh, uh, major platforms, including StockCharts.com, Bloomberg and Reuters, and so forth, uh, been in the marketplace for 35 years. And then a unique way of looking at relative price performance, and we'll show you that and why it's so important. And then in the middle, for those of you who uh, like to time uh, additions to a portfolio and so forth, we have buy and sell signals. But this pyramid really is all you need to make solid investment decisions or talk about individual stocks with prospects and with clients. So at the heart of all this, the Chaikin Power Gauge rating, a very simple display, but please don't confuse simple with simplistic because under the hood, there's a lot of number crunching going on. I like to say that the Chaikin Power Gauge rating is like a Chevrolet with a Ferrari engine under the hood. And as you'll see in a minute, it can be your GPS during earnings season. It can points you to the stocks that are likely to report positive earnings surprises or disappoint. And I'll show you on the next slide why that's so important. So the Chaikin Power Gauge rating looks at four primary factors, value, growth, technicals, and sentiment. And within each of those, there are five sub-factors. The weights were all locked down in September of 2010, as were the factors. So nothing has changed in seven and a half years. That's really important because a lot of people are chasing alpha by looking to see which factors are working now. That just never works because you're always behind the curve. Uh, value is 35% of the model. So 
free cash flow to market cap and price to sales, actually almost 20% of the overall model. If that sounds like Warren Buffett or Seth Klarman or uh, Rob Arnott at Research Affiliates, it should because these are key value metrics that they use for stock selection and have for 30 and 40 years. But there are some more sensitive factors in the model like earnings surprise and earnings estimate revision. Uh, in the 80s, I was at Drexel Burnham. I had the good fortune to work with George Douglas, who had their quantitative database. George did the original research in earnings surprise and earnings estimate revision. And what George told me has stuck with me and it uh, is incorporated into the model. Earnings surprises come in bunches. There's never just one of them. And they lead analysts to raise or lower their estimates. And to this day, in spite of what you read in the press, Analyst estimate revisions at major Wall Street banks are the single biggest short-term driver of stock price movement. So in the model, we've got longer-term factors that don't change very often, the value metrics, shorter-term, more sensitive factors, but they persist over time. And then, of course, industry group and sector strength, very important, and we're going to focus on that uh, for a good chunk of today's presentation. Now, the model works and has worked since... 2011 when it was introduced because it's based on how Wall Street works. This is not a model that was developed by some newly minted PhD out of MIT throwing digital spaghetti at the wall. That's what got us in trouble in 2008 or 1998 when some Nobel Prize winners at long-term capital management built a model that just didn't work in the real world but got us into big financial trouble. So how has the model performed? Well, Life to date, going back to 1999, this includes back-tested results and then seven years of real-time performance. In the Russell 3000, the average very bullish stock up 20%, the average very bearish stock up only 1%, and that's after a nine-year bull market. If we were looking at this uh, in 2009, the average very bearish stock would have been down 5 or 6% over the previous 10 years. So... From our point of view, if you're doing bottom-up stock selection or evaluating ETFs, you want a preponderance of bullish power gauge ratings in the stocks in that ETF, or if you're building a bottom-up stock portfolio, you want stocks with a very bullish rating. If you are using something like the Chaikin power gauge rating to evaluate and filter your firm's research, that is a really excellent way, if you're a discretionary manager, to separate uh, the good from the bad, even within a firm's research department. Now, in 2015, it was really important to know which stocks had a bearish rating in our multi-factor model. Why? Because energy stocks went into their own bear market. We're often asked, well, the power gauge rating has worked, but you've been in a bull market the whole time. You could throw darts and make money in a bull market. And my response has always been, yes, unless your dart landed on an energy stock in 2015 because the average very bearish stock in the Russell 3000 was down over 17%. Think about that. Small caps in general were down over 22%. The Russell 2000 was in its own little bear market driven by fracking stocks and energy stocks in general. So this works in bull and bear markets. Now, one final proof point, and we'll get to some really specific examples. Uh, we have a partnership with NASDAQ where we've created three NASDAQ shaken indices, large, small, and mid. I'm sorry, and dividend achiever. And uh, New York Life's Index IQ subsidiary licensed all three and launched the first exchange-traded fund using a top-down rules-based methodology based on the power gauge rating in May of 2017, the large cap was launched in December of 2017, almost a billion dollars in these two ETFs. Very unusual for a new ETF to get 500 million in assets. Not a recommendation to buy it, just proof that the power gauge works, not just for intermediate term, but on a buy and hold basis, because these are indices that are rebalanced once a year. So very proud after a 50-year career to have rung the opening bell on NASDAQ with our team and with Index IQ on April 30th. So now uh, let's look at what you came to this webinar for. 
um, how to find bullish stocks and bullish ETFs and know which ones to avoid. So we have a pattern called classic shake and bull. It's just three pieces. Power gauge rating is bullish, meaning the fundamental potential for a stock is strong based on that 20-factor model. It's outperforming the market, and shake and money flow is strong, telling you that institutional investors are accumulating the stock. So here's our poster child. We've been using this for nine months for a classic shake and bull. It's Centene Corp, Medicare provider, Medicaid provider that actually figured out how to make money in a, uh, an environment where the government is pulling back uh, and funding Medicaid. And yet the power gauge rating on this one-year chart, and by the way, we read a chart from the bottom up. The reason being our go-to directional indicator is the power gauge rating, and that's a ribbon at the bottom of the chart. So power gauge rating for Centene has been bullish almost exclusively for the last year. So that's your directional edge. And then right above that, our unique way of looking at relative price performance, we convert it into a heat map. So for those of you who use Investors Business Daily or Dorsey Wright, they've got their own way of doing it. We like it to be very visual. And when stock with a bullish rating is outperforming the market, we say the market agrees with the model because no matter how good your fundamental research is or your firm's research is, if the market doesn't agree with you, guess who wins? The market always wins. Then we go back up to money flow. Check in money flow oscillates between red and green around a zero line. We want to see institutional accumulation in stocks that we own or we're thinking of buying. Then we look at the price action. And on this chart, we have one of our six pairs of buy and sell signals relative strength signal that's very, very powerful, tends to last four to eight weeks, and you get price acceleration. And that's what Centene did. It accelerated yesterday into this morning earning, earnings report, and that's right up on the top. So everything you need to know to analyze a stock, to talk intelligently about that stock to a prospect or a client who owns it, is right here on this chart. So we knew that Centene was due to report, Analysts were actually raising their estimates into the report. We have that green exclamation point telling us that. And you've seen some profit taking. Uh, the stock is down around three points today. If we get two or three days of profit taking, that may, that may be another good entry point if you like healthcare and you think Centene is uh, one of the leaders and will continue to be. Now, We've also introduced something new in Shaken Analytics. I know we have some of our subscribers on the call today. It's a printable chart, and it's a little different than the screen view we're looking at because it shows you the power gauge rating and the four primary factors and then some more information about earnings estimates, market cap yield, and so forth. This is a wonderful uh, tool because if you're talking to a client about a stock, you can print this chart, nice clean white background, not killing a lot of trees to get the ink in there, and put it in the file or save it digitally. So uh, this is in response to uh, a demand from advisors who want a record of what the stock looked like when they were talking to clients about it. Now, it's nice to know there's a pattern like the classic shake and bull, but the question has always come up, how do we find these stocks? So we created a screener that's unique in that it enables our members, our subscribers, to screen on the factors in the 20-factor model as well as the rating itself and to start out with whatever universe you like. So for a webinar I did before I went out to California last Wednesday, I screened the large cap growth universe because I felt, as I said, that large caps were going to start catching fire again. Uh, and I wanted uh, a, a short list of stocks, so I filtered 530 names down to uh, just these 12 you see on the screen by requiring that the power gauge rating be bullish, that free cash flow be strong, and that the two technicals, money flow and relative strength, were positive. And I got a list of 12 stocks. That becomes my watch list. Buying opportunities present themselves, so Centene's on there. We've already seen that. And Biogen was on there. And Biogen, as you'll see in a minute, responded very positively to earnings today. So 
this is how easy it is to apply that discipline methodology. Now, the classic shake and bear is just as important because uh, whether you're doing your own research or your firm's fundamental research, there are going to be stocks that uh, in a quantitative model are running counter to that research. So what is a classic bear? The power gauge rating is bearish, meaning that those 20 factors are fundamentally against uh, positive performance. It's underperforming the market, and shaken money flow is red, not green, telling you that institutional investors are selling the stock. So here's Whirlpool, which is a poster child for a classic shake and bear. It's gone nowhere in a market that's making new highs. And at the bottom of the chart, we see why. The power gauge has been bearish since late January. The stock has been underperforming the market for the last 12 months, so the market agrees with the model. And look at the institutional selling that's been going on since February. Shake and money flow tells you that institutions are using any excuse, any rally in the stock to get out of it. And Whirlpool reported earnings before the opening this morning. And you'll see in a minute what happened. Uh, the stock had a very negative reaction to the earnings report. And that's validation. So in overnight trading, pre-market trading this morning, Whirlpool was down 13 points down 14% when we started the webinar in response to a negative earnings surprise. On the other hand, Biogen, which showed up on that screen last Wednesday, positive earnings surprise up 3 or 4% earlier today, 20 points before the opening when I did this slide. Validation for the power gauge happens every day. It also happens over time as the NASDAQ taken indices have shown. So. I'd like to uh, sort of segue into the next poll question. So, Natalie, if you're there, this one, I think, gives you uh, multiple choice answers. Great. Thank Great. Thank you, Mark. All right. The second poll question reads, how do you differentiate your practice from the competition? And you can select all that apply to you. You can choose from the following, idea generation, stocks, ETF selection, holistic wealth management, or enhanced client communication? Again, the answer is read idea generations or stocks, ETF selection, holistic wealth management, or enhanced client communication. And you can click your answer directly on the screen and hit submit. So Mark, it looks like almost 73% of the audience says holistic wealth management with about 44% saying enhanced client communication. What are your thoughts on these results? Well, I think this is what an advisor needs to do to differentiate himself from robos and uh, really provide that full service experience that helps the client uh, survive bear markets and make some sense out of uh, their financial future. But I also think that there are still advisors picking stocks, selecting ETFs, and what we do at Shaken Analytics actually uh, enhances client communication because it makes an advisor more knowledgeable about the overall financial landscape because you can't possibly be knowledgeable on 5,000 U.S. equities, but clients want to talk about stocks. So for the balance of the webinar, we're going to talk about using sectors and sector ETFs and industry group ETFs to allocate client assets. We do that by analyzing the 10 select spider sector ETFs using something we call our power bar ratings. We then drill down on strong sectors to see the best stocks in those sectors for people who are using bottom-up stock selection. And we find those stocks with the best potential in the sector ETFs. So uh, we talked about the power bar, and it enables us to find strong sectors and industry groups. And research has shown that uh, investing in sector ETFs and in industry group ETFs uh, that have been strong will give you a tailwind, and particularly the stocks in those groups. Whereas if you're investing in weak sectors, and right now that would be uh, consumer staples, it would be uh, the defensive sectors uh, that have really been underperforming, you're faced with headwinds. 
So what is this power bar that we use to rank uh, sectors and, and uh, ETFs and industry groups and so forth? Well, it's a very simple concept. We look at the constituents in any ETF and we determine how many have bullish versus bearish ratings in our multi-factor model. That gives us the power bar. And when there are more bullish stocks by a wide majority, that typically has resulted in that ETF outperforming the market. So it tells you what the potential is for the holdings in an ETF. And you'd be very surprised within any category, like small cap blend or large cap growth, there's a big difference between the best and the worst power bars for ETFs. Now, in August, we're going to launch the Chaikin Power Gauge rating for ETFs that's going to combine the fundamentals and the technicals. It's going to be unique. We've been working on this for three years. We want to get it right. So we're going to have another level of ETF analysis. But we've done extremely well with our advisor clients by just looking at the power bars or the select spider sector ETFs as a guide to where to focus your asset allocation. So here's the sector performance for the last six months of the uh, 10 select spider sector ETFs. And there's going to be a new one because they're realigning these called the communications uh, ETF uh, coming in September. But working with what we have now, uh, technology shows the best power bar followed by consumer discretionary. Uh, and down at the bottom, we've got um, sort of uh, consumer staples. And I'd like to take a look at what the power bars look like in those 10 select spider sector ETFs. That was price performance. So we were looking at price performance uh, where you had technology and consumer discretionary leading the pack. Now let's look at what the power bars are actually saying today. And um, what you've got here is utilities and financials. Uh, I think the rally in utilities is um, unsustainable because these companies don't benefit from the tax cuts that were passed, and they're constrained in terms of growth potential. We are in a growth market, in my view. So let's look at the technology ETF where there's 17 stocks with bullish ratings in the SP500, only four with bearish, and then the consumer staples, which is down at the bottom with three bullish and 10 bearish stocks. So here's a one-year chart of the XLK, the Select Spider Sector Technology ETF, and two things to note here. It's been outperforming the market for 12 months, so it's not a Johnny-come-lately sector, even though people have said too much waiting in tech. And it's been making new highs ahead of the S&P 500. So what I'd like to do is zero in on two stocks in the sector. On the left, we show you all the bullish stocks in the sector. We start with the bulls and go all the way to the bears. So we're going to take a look at Facebook and then Computer Associates. So here's Facebook. And at the bottom of the chart is a pattern that's very, very important. Too often on Wall Street, we put our feet in cement. So we've created a concept called a bullish or bearish personality change. And that's why our relative strength heat map is so critical. If a stock or an ETF goes from underperforming or red on our heat map to outperforming or green, we call that a bullish personality change. And that happened in early May for Facebook which had gone through that correction based on privacy concerns and the leaking of data to Cambridge Associates and so forth. And all along, the institutions were accumulating the stock. They didn't bail on the stock, even though it sold off from uh, 190 to 150. They were accumulating it. How do we know that? Shaken money flow stayed green the whole time. That's that combination of fundamentals and technicals. The power gauge rating has been bullish since early May. And then we got this little pullback uh, two and a half weeks ago, uh, which was a buying opportunity. This is our oversold buy signal. Comes on an eight-day low in a stock that has a bullish power gauge rating. So very powerful way. Start with the sector XLK, zero in on a strong stock with a bullish rating, like Facebook, that satisfies all our criteria. Now, Computer Associates got a huge takeover bid from Broadcom, but it had a very similar pattern to Facebook. In fact, the personality change came in 
mid-February, when it went from underperforming to outperforming, series of buy signals, in this case the relative strength buy with money flow very positive. So uh, this stock was under accumulation, and as you'll see in a minute, the computer software group was also strong. And you got a buy signal about a week and a half before that big takeover bid when the stock went from 36 to 44. So sometimes it's better to be lucky than good. And in this case, uh, you didn't really need luck because the signal was right there. Now, just as with the classic shake and bull pattern, we've heard from advisors that one of the things they like about shake and analytics is that we alert them in a daily email to the signals or changes in power gauge rating or earnings estimates on the stocks that they're following and also on one other market index. Typically, it's the S&P 500, but for small cap managers, it could be the Russell 2000. So on June 26, I got this email alert on a 40-stock portfolio that I monitor because Citrix had triggered a buy signal at 104. The stock proceeded to rally to 111. Uh, but you would have gotten this if you were following Facebook in your portfolio or your list, and you would have seen that buy signal or the buy signal in Computer Associates uh, if you were following the S&P 500. So a very efficient way to manage your time and see new ideas, actionable ideas, without having to do the heavy lifting. Now, I said that we like to drill down, so if the XLK is strong, I want to start looking at other technology ETFs ranked by the power bar. And when I did that this morning, the XSW, the Select Spider Sector uh, Software ETF, basically an industry group ETF with over 120 software names, is right at the top. 46 stocks with bullish ratings, only two with bearish ratings in the software group. So this is what the chart looks like. Even stronger than the technology sector, that wonderful stair-step pattern of higher highs and higher lows. I'm also, I'm often asked, how do you know if a stock's in an uptrend? I said, it's so easy. You see a pattern of higher highs and higher lows, whether it's a stock, an ETF, or a market average, until proven otherwise, that's a very bullish pattern and new highs uh, ahead of the market and ahead of tech itself, outperforming except for that brief period in December and January. So again, on the left are all the stocks in that ETF, 120 of them ranked by the power gauge rating, and I'll just zero in on one FTC first data corp to show you, uh, again, chart pattern that's very, very useful. So we had that bullish personality change. Here's a case where FTC was in a downtrend and then started outperforming the market based on a gap up on a positive earnings surprise. Now, I'm not a big fan of chasing gaps, particularly in the kind of market we've been in for the last uh, six months, but I do like to enter a stock, establish a position on that first buy signal after the personality change. So in this case, about a month later, a week, three weeks later, there was an oversold buy signal, came at 19. That was a wonderful entry as the stock has rallied up to 24. So all the ingredients were in place, and again, the alerts come at you if you're following uh, the SP500 or if it happens to be in your list of stocks. Now, I took the liberty of using our screening program to screen for small and mid-cap software stocks with very bullish ratings because, as we've mentioned earlier, small caps have been strong. And I was able to distill down uh, the computer software and service industry, which has about 164 names, down to just four. And one of them, VRIT, is the stock that we've highlighted many, many times over the last three months. Uh, that's what the stock looks like. All the ingredients we've talked about are in place, reading from the bottom up, power gauge is bullish, outperforming the market, under accumulation by check and money flow, and a buy signal happened uh, about two and a half weeks ago. And this is the kind of discipline, whether you're looking to choose ETFs or individual stocks, that can really help you improve your client performance, add alpha to a portfolio, 
And if all you do is what we're going to show you in the next segment, which is to play good defense, you're going to improve client performance. So what is playing good defense? Well, it means knowing which stocks not to buy, knowing which sectors and industry groups have weak power bars. And as I said in late uh, August, we're going to introduce a shaken power gauge rating for ETFs with fundamentals and technicals blended in. So one way to play good defense is to see which sectors are performing with negative power bars. So consumer staples is one we identified. It's had a nice little retracement rally, but if you look at the peak at 59 and the trough at 49, you realize that this is not a sector you wanted to be in in 2018. So playing good defense means avoiding the sector ETF and then zeroing in on the weakest stocks in that sector in case they're in client portfolios. So in this case, I zeroed in on two that we've mentioned over and over and over again in our weekly and daily market letters, Philip Morris and S.D. Lauder. So here's Philip Morris, again, a one-year chart. Power gauge has been bearish, underperforming the market, under distribution, and right before earnings were released in April, my associate, Dan Russo, who's uh, the head of the uh, Charter Market Technicians New York chapter and writes our morning market commentary, uh, identified Philip Morris as his bearish stock of the day. Why? Because all three of these negative conditions were in place and it had triggered a sell signal. And you had, just as you did today with Whirlpool, a bearish earnings surprise, a negative reaction to guidance, and the stock dropped from uh, about 100 all the way down to 78. So this is an example of playing good defense. It's also a way that you can have uh, a very rich conversation with prospects who might own Philip Morris or with clients who have a position. Maybe they've got a tax basis that uh, ostensibly says, I don't want to sell it and pay the taxes. I've always been a big believer that uh, unless you have zero cost and the company is thriving, I'd rather pay the taxes or use them to offset gains than watch a stock drop from 100 to 78. That's painful, and it makes you doubt your decision-making. So playing good defense enables you to do this, that. Now, SD Lauder is a cosmetics company that, where the power gauge has just recently turned bearish and where it's just now had that rollover to a bearish personality change, where it's now underperforming the market. So uh, we could still be early in the game. Uh, the peak on SD Lauder was around 155. This is, again, our new printable chart that shows you that all the four factors, the primary factors in the power gauge are bearish, which suggests that this company is going to have Tough time getting traction on the upside. It's trading at 140. Again, what a wonderful conversation to have with a client who owns SD Lauder or with a prospect who has it. You're going to be more knowledgeable than anyone else they're talking to in the investment community. So that's what playing good defense means. Now, one final sort of uh, feature to Chaken Analytics that has yielded huge benefits to our advisor clients is our stock discovery engine because it provides profitable swap ideas and another reason to talk to a client. You seed it with a stock. In this case, I seeded it with Philip Morris, which has a bearish rating, large cap stock. It tells you why, uh, it, how it's characterizing Philip Morris. And First, it identifies stocks with similar patterns to Philip Morris, so Procter & Gamble uh, in consumer staples, VGR in the tobacco business. But more importantly, it suggests potential swaps. So in this case, either Archer Daniels or Coca-Cola Enterprises are two uh, stocks which might be a good replacement for Philip Morris. Obviously, if you did this two or three months ago, you would have been ahead of that uh, negative earnings surprise and very happy uh, to have switched out into stocks with bullish power gauge ratings that are moving higher and 
the combination of fundamentals and technicals in both those stocks was very, very attractive. So uh, Chaikin Analytics is normally $2,195 for an annual subscription. You can go to chaikinanalytics.com slash RIA, and we've got a special offer for you. And it includes, at its heart, that 20-factor model that's driving those two ETFs with a billion dollars in them. Also includes the stock discovery engine, and amongst a lot of other features, as a Chaikin subscriber, you get member-only access to Dan Russo's weekly strategy webinars. Uh, you also get unlimited coaching. We have uh, people who are former RIAs who've been in your seat, who are in our customer success department just to talk to advisors like yourself. And then you get Dan Russo's Morning Market Insights, which is a great pre-market read, so you don't have to stay glued to CNBC to know what's going on in the markets. So it's a complete package. And I think the most uh, compelling endorsement that we've gotten is from John Malden. I know many of you read his macro newsletters. John uh, was introduced to Chaikin Analytics almost three years ago. And he gave us this endorsement. He said, I'm impressed by what Mark has done. My analysts are enthusiastic users of Chaikin and use it to analyze the trades and recommendations of our writing team. Uh, it's been integrated into our routine due diligence process for vetting and evaluating potential investments. Couldn't get a better endorsement than one from John Malden and his team. So we'd like to make a special offer for the RIA uh, community, the RIA database community, and reduce the list price from $21.95 down to a webinar special of only $1,795 for an annual subscription. $400 off, takenanalytics.com slash RIA. The offer is good until Friday at midnight. And if you have any questions on anything you've heard, we're going to get to the Q&A now, uh, which Natalie's going to curate, just call 877-697-6783, and we've got people who will be happy to answer any of your questions. So before we get to the Q&A, I'd just like to thank you all for staying with us and to RIA Database for turning out such an engaged audience. So Natalie, uh, if you see any questions that you think would be of interest to people, why don't we uh, get into that in the time that's remaining? Great. Thank you, Mark, for such an informative presentation. As a reminder, a copy of today's presentation, as well as additional documents, can be found in the green folder at the bottom of your screen. We appreciate your feedback, so please take a moment to fill out our brief survey located in the teal folder. Our speaker today will be taking advisor questions. Please type your question in the box to the right of the slides. We'll get to as many of your questions as possible. In the event your question is not answered on today's webcast, a member of the Chaikin Analytics team will reach out to you directly. We also have a one-on-one -on -one meeting request located in the blue folder, also at the bottom of the screen, in case you'd like to have a conversation to further discuss the ideas that were covered during today's event. With that, let's take our first question. So Mark, it looks like the first question reads, have you ever singled out government, sorry, have you ever singled out government policy as a factor how do you position for major policy changes such as Obamacare, Dodd-Frank, and tax reform? That's a great question because it's almost impossible to model that in a multi-factor quantitative model. The way we solve for that problem is three of the factors in the model, earnings surprise, analyst earnings estimate revision, and analyst opinion changes, plus industry group relative strength, enable us to monitor what the smartest people on Wall Street are doing and saying. So that's the component we call sentiment or expert opinions. By monitoring analyst uh, estimate changes and monitoring analyst opinion changes, which are driven by macro factors, so the analysts, the short sellers, the insiders, who are in a better position to know how these various macro factors affect their company, rather than predict where currencies are going or interest rates or changes in government health care policy, we found that by monitoring the smartest people on Wall Street, the analysts, the insiders, the short sellers, 
we get the benefit of their thinking by aggregating what they're doing and saying about a stock. Great. Thank you so much, Mark. The second question from an advisor reads, I'm curious to understand your approach to fund slash ETF selection based on a client's risk tolerance. Also, is your approach purely technical or are there some fundamental components involved? Uh, good question. There are clearly fundamental components involved. That's the power bar and then our new hybrid rating, uh, the power gauge rating for ETFs that's coming out in August will be a blend of the roll-up of the power gauge ratings for each of the constituents and fundamentals combined with technicals, so the technical uh, trading patterns of the ETF. We've already seen how important relative strength is, particularly in sectors and industry groups, but also in style and size like small versus large or value versus growth. There are big macro trends that persists for extended periods of time. So relative price performance uh, is really important. I know a lot of you use and subscribe to Dorsey Wright, which is a great service. We take that relative strength to a visual uh, and put it on the chart so that you can see it versus the price action for the last 12 months. So we definitely believe in fundamentals and technicals. In terms of risk, um, the volatility of an ETF the uh, liquidity, uh, the number of constituents. Uh, we do all of that in our ETF uh, screener uh, that's part of Chaken Analytics. So uh, we think risk tolerance is important, but it's not just uh, volatility risk, it's liquidity and concentration risk as well. And uh, just as an aside, uh, I think very few people would say that the SPY is risky, but uh, from my point of view, if you're making a bet on a cap-weighted index which where six of the stocks have accounted for over 70% of the performance in, the, in 2018, uh, that's risk from my perspective, but we know that SPY has more assets than any other ETF. So everybody defines risk differently. We believe in equal weighting as a way to mitigate risk uh, because you're spreading your portfolio over um, a, you know, a large number of stocks with equal weights at the beginning of the rebalance period. So I think risk is important, and that's one of the ways that we deal with it in terms of our index construction uh, aspect of the business. Great. Thank you so much, Mark. The last question that we'll get to today reads, is the idea essentially to be our own active managers of portfolio made up of several passive exposures? Well, I think that's a very good way to differentiate yourself from the robos who are allocating primarily to SPY, IWM, uh, you know, the, the various uh, big fixed income uh, ETFs. From our point of view, having worked with advisors uh, like uh, those of you on the webinar today, um, if you can differentiate yourself, uh, you have a much stronger conversation with your client when it comes to fees, because we all know there's been fee compression in ETFs, which has been good for all of us, but now there's starting to be fee compression at the advisor level. So uh, when it comes to that conversation, and I'm sure uh, you know everybody laughs when they see the Schwab commercial on TV where the client is asking about fees, when it comes to that fee conversation, if you've been creative at finding passive vehicles that can add alpha, like, uh, for instance, the Chaken large cap ETF CLRG or the Chaken small cap CSML, uh, the IQ Chaken, uh, again, not a recommendation, just as an, as an example. If you can find vehicles based on a disciplined methodology that either your firm has created or you've created that can add alpha and differentiate you from the robos and from a typical advisor who's just following a sleeve, uh, then I think you've got a much richer conversation uh, with the client and uh, a call on his loyalty and his longevity over time. Also a great way to get that younger generation of clients who think they can do it themselves. I mean, I, we ask a lot of advisors, uh, of your three biggest accounts, do you have the children? And the answer is invariably no. They're doing it on their own. 
Well, if you've been creative and have found a methodology that works for you uh, that's different, you're more likely to get that next generation uh, to stay with you rather than disappear into the robo community. So uh, with that, Natalie, I'd really like to thank uh, RAA Database and all the advisors who stayed with us uh, in what I hope was a very informative webinar. Uh, again, our people are standing by, 877-697-6783, and uh, I look forward to our next webinar.